Good morning, everybody. God bless you. Glad to be here with everybody today in uh, spirit and truth. I got some folks here that I'm here with body and spirit and truth, and I love that. The body of Christ physical, and you, the body of Christ spiritually, our brothers and sisters, and we just praise God for you uh, joining with us today. We think we're going to be in Ezra a little bit today, uh, but that'll be after a little while. We've got to understand and know the heart and mind of God. Where is God today? Down there in Houston, Texas, Joel Olstein is preaching love, 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 and uh, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. Well, Joel, if you read your Bible, you'd know that you're a hypocrite. You're a heretic. That's what the Bible says about you and your kind, because you always preach a different Jesus. You preach American Jesus, who wants to bless you and keep the inertia rolling. And blessing, 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 blessing. Love, 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 love. And thank God he's a loving God who showed his love to us while we were still sinners. God doesn't wait for you to clean up for him to like you and for him to love you and for him to shed his blood for you. He did it while we were filthy, raunchy, nasty sinners, his enemies. God died for us. Aren't you thankful for that? He is a God of love. He's a God of mercy. I see his mercy every morning. It's by his mercies that he didn't kill me last night. It's by his mercies that he kept me saved. It's by his mercies he kept the Holy Spirit of God in me. His mercy had a wonderful plan that if I would believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ, I would be saved and Jesus Christ himself would enter me via his Holy Spirit. I am attached to heaven, guys. I'm attached, uh, attached to the Jesus on the throne through the Holy Spirit of God in me. We have heaven here on earth, and that's what we pray, Lord. As it is in heaven, let it be that way here on earth. And we have the love of God all around us, and there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Now, there's a whole lot that can separate him from your love. Hello? There's nothing that can separate you from his love, but there's a whole lot that can separate him from your love. <laughs> what have you done to prove your love to him in private in the past 168 hours from last Sunday? What have you done? Only you know that, and only the Holy Spirit knows that, and Jesus Christ himself in heaven knows that. Aren't you thankful that he redeems time? Aren't you thankful that once you've blown it and you're stupid, and the Holy Spirit brings it to you and says, man, you wasted a whole lot of time this week. We come back to him and we say, oh, holy ghost, God, please, Jesus, help me, man. I don't want to waste my time. I want it to be all redeemed and to your blessing, to your honor, to your glory. And he redeems our time. He saves it too. Aren't you thankful he saves your time just like he saved your raunchy soul? That's our God. That's love, 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 love. Hey guys, God has come to the end of all of that. Very soon here in the very near future, people aren't going to be able to be saved the same way that we are today. There's going to be a dynamic change there's going to be a dynamic change. We call it dispensational change. What does that mean? The way God works with people groups at different times. And right now, for the last 2,000 years, we look to the cross of Jesus Christ, and by faith, a preacher comes and tells me about the death, burial, and resurrection. He died in my place, and I believe that. And I'm saved, sealed, and I'm going to heaven, and I will be raptured. Aren't you thankful for the package deal on that? Isn't that wonderful? No, he saved me when I was bad. He saved me when I was evil. He saved me when I was in a dung hill. And now he keeps me saved. Now that he's cleaned me up and washed me and he's going to rapture me, man. Aren't you thankful for that? That he's going to rapture you because you're saved. Because the blood of Jesus Christ has washed away and cleansed all the sins. And the Holy Spirit has come in inside of you, sealed himself in as a promise of down payment. That's what the Bible teaches. That is the Greek in that passage, the Aramaic in that passage, the Hebrew. That's God talking and saying, I'm keeping you saved. This ain't about you. It's about me. Aren't you thankful it's about Jesus? It's all about Jesus. But right now, all the way through the Bible, when Jesus has, when the Father has come to the end of himself, he gets angry. He gets livid. He gets mad. He gets irate. And guys, you and I have got to know that that's where he is right now. Praise God, you and I still see his love. We will, he, nothing can separate us from his love. Aren't you thankful for that? Yeah. That's you and I, the brother. That's you and I, the saint. That's you and I, the child of God. That's you and I, the bride, the body of Christ. But there's a group that is going to be separated from his love. That's that group going to hell. He loved all of them on this side, and they hated what he did. They mocked what he did. They didn't care about him. They preferred their gods. They, they had choice gods over him. And the whole world has gone back to paganism. Everybody is 
praising the queen and how glorious she was. And she just loved God. She loved Lucifer. I love Lucy. That was her call. That was her cry. She loves Lucifer. You can go online, and Vonda will share this later after the sermon in the, in the links, in the, in the comments, uh, about her going through her Druid ceremony right when she was queened. Right when she was queen, she went through a Druid ceremony. That means she's a witch. That means she hates God. She hates Jesus Christ. She detests, she despises the blood of Jesus. And the whole Christian church is so blind that they think she loves Jesus. Um, I'm hoping you're saved. Because, you know, we gloriously sing in church, I once was blind, but now I see. I see more people in the church blind now than I ever have in my life. I was once blind, but now I'm blinder. And guys, you're going to be blind if you don't know the truth, read the truth, and are willing to change in your heart. That means repent. You're going to, your heart, your mind, everything, your thoughts will match the word of God. That's what repentance means. We call you the church, Jesus. The very last sermons he preached in the book of Revelation, chapter two and three, he was calling out to his people to repent, 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 repent. Change your thinking to mine. How many people do you meet along the way, people who are devout Christians who really think an awful lot like God does? Or are they thinking more like the world around them? They have not repented, guys. We are calling you to repent. We're calling you to think like God. What that means is you're going to have to get a whole lot of Bible in you. You're going to have to read the Bible, meditate on the Bible, memorize the Bible, let the Bible be your everything, shut the TV off and all the extra noises that keep the word of God from being activated and alive in your heart. I'm going to read some verses right now where God is. I will post these verses, references, when I repost the sermon, okay? I'll, I'll mention them, but I'll, I'll repost them. We're going to go through them pretty quickly. But you got to know that God is angry right now. He is livid, and he is about to fry this world and kill sinners. God has had enough. God has always killed sinners in the Bible. Have you read the Bible lately? Remember, what the, the great part of the gospel story is he killed Jesus, his only begotten son, on my behalf so he wouldn't have to come at me in rage and anger. And when he sees the blood, he passes over. It's important that you are saved today. You know the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been covered in his blood because you believe the story of God, his Bible, his scripture, his gospel concerning Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection. And all those who are covered in the blood will not face what I'm talking about right now. But there's going to be a whole bunch of people who are in church today who's going to face this because you've not truly been born again. You're coming some other way. You're, you're including with the blood other things. You can't include anything else along the blood. It's a matter of faith in what God did for you, his salvation plan for you. He left heaven in the form of a man. And he died in our place, death, burial, and resurrection. He lived holy. He's righteous. Jesus is absolute God. You must believe this story. If you don't believe that he's absolute God, he's the only wise God, and there's other gods beside him, he's just one of the many Christ, you're going to hell and you're lost right now. If you think that Jesus uh, wasn't strong enough, wasn't powerful enough to save you on his own by the Father's plan, you need to help him out. You need to be baptized. You need to do good works. You need to stay a, a, a keep a life of maintenance and repentance. If you got to help him out, you're lost. What purpose was it that he came and went through all this suffering if you could have done something about it? You can't do anything about it. And guys, you got to know before we continue on that you are truly saved. You are born again. You've been born from above by God himself, because you believe in what he did on that cross for you. And he didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose from the dead and he ascended to heaven with the promise that he'd come back in the same like manner that we saw him go. Do you believe that? Do you believe it in your heart? Is this your operating system? Or do you have that as an operating system plus something else? The Holy Spirit must be our operating system through his scriptures, through the word, and we believe it. It all begins with salvation. That's believing in the finished work. When we do that, we come to the conclusion that Jesus is the only way to heaven and my belief in him is the only way I'm going to get there. My belief in him is the only thing that activates the price that he paid for me. So I want to activate it in my life. I'm saved. The Holy Spirit comes in, seals himself in, and nothing will be able to separate you from the love of God. Aren't you thankful for that? But here's where God is with the rest of them. Those of you that are not saved, here's where God is with you right now. Matthew 20. 1, 13, and it begins in the house of the Lord. 
And he said unto them, it's written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you idiots have turned it into a, a place of getting a bunch of money. Make yourself a bunch of money. Sell my books. Buy my books. Uh, we're raising a bunch of money for our building fund. We got over 800000 raised of $2 million, And you all just keep giving to the building fund. Don't you understand that God's about to destroy all your buildings? Don't you understand that it, it has never been about a building since the temple was destroyed? It has never been about a building since Jesus rose from the dead. It's never been about a building since the day of Pentecost in A.D. 30. You are that building. You are God's husbandry, Paul teaches us in 1 Corinthians 3. We are the building of God. We are the temple of God. He that comes inside of us comes inside of a temple. That is the only temple that matters, not one made of stones and by somebody else's hands. God created this temple for himself to dwell in. Will you believe that? You've, he said, I meant it to be a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. I saw a play the other day, The Life of David. The Life of David, great play. All, all these plays at the Sound and Sight and Sound. Sight and Sound puts on Branson and, and, and Pennsylvania, great stuff. But when you, have a, when you have four chapters and you have to turn it into a two-hour something, you're going to throw in some uh, artistic license in there somewhere, okay? And so you have to stretch it and make it work. We're watching David. There's no purpose to stretch David. He's in so much of the Bible, you don't have to stretch him. You can just tell the Bible story and whatever. One of the main things you'll see in that is they had the, the hexagram everywhere, the Star of David. That what didn't even exist in David's kingdom. David abhorred that thing. It was his son Solomon who brought it in, and it's also called the Seal of Solomon. And so they had this, these hexagrams all over David's stuff, and his belt buckle was a goat. And so they got all this stuff going on because he was a mighty warrior. You know, this lion goat is what it was. It was a chimera-looking thing. And then we've got uh, just so much being added to it. And if you don't know your Bible, you're going to think that that's the Bible. Guys, you got to know your Bible. You got to understand it. You got to, to, to love it. And God intended for the, us, the body of Christ, to be the place where God can reside in peace. Is your life, that what you did this week, is it a temple of peace? Is it a temple of prayer? God intended for your temple to be a temple of prayer and don't turn it into a den of thieves. What's in it for me? I was talking to a dear friend about somebody we know, and all she does is thinks about manipulating and the money and, and the final numbers and how can I come out ahead? That's satanic. God calls you a, a, a den of thieves. And God's angry today, Deuteronomy 9, 8. I like that 17 in there. I like that 5, Deuteronomy, that's grace, and that 17 in there, that's victory. Now, that's for you and me. Look at the opposite side of that, the other side of that. Even at Mount Horeb, you provoked the Lord under wrath, and the Lord was so angry with you that he would have destroyed you right then and there. God has a dispensation of destruction in him when he's come to the end of the line of his mercy and grace. When he has a timeline and you won't repent, you won't turn to him, you won't believe in that timeline, he's coming after you to kill you. And God's on his way with that right now. We believe it might be this month. Based on the count, I had a buddy that made a post that says, I'm not going to involve myself in the count this year. I'm just not going to be part of it because I, I, don't, I was let down years ago. We're to count every year, man. Yeah. Don't go teaching people wrong on your site. You're supposed to be a great teacher. We count every year because every year we're looking for Jesus. Turning people away from the count, turning away people from the joy, turning away people from the blessings of the barley and the wheat and the new wine and the oil and the wood count for the sacrifices, turning people away. Don't you dare turn people away just because you get down and depressed and it didn't work for you last time. We are to count every year. We're always looking for Jesus, whether it's this year or next. What if Jesus doesn't come? People always ask me, what if Jesus doesn't come this time? Well, I'll count next time. Amen. That's what we do. We count. He told us to count. He told us to count. He told us to count. You to tell people, to, I'm not counting. You better count. You better count. You better repent. You better get on the page with Jesus Christ. Exodus 15, 7. And in the greatness of your excellence, you overthrow those who rise up against you. You send forth your burning anger and it consumes like chaff. It'll consume the chaff. God's anger is enraged at this very moment for non-believers. Every one of us, before we were saved, God's wrath was kindled against us. He that has the Son of God has life. 
But he that has not the Son of God has not life, but he has the wrath of God abiding on him. That's every person. And you must be awakened not to Joel Olstein's preaching, because he never preaches about the wrath of God. He never preaches what he's in the middle of. That Joel Olstein has never been saved because he has placed his faith, if he has faith at all, in a wrong Jesus, in a wrong character, in a devil. And people just love him and they follow him in droves, like, 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 love, 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 care, 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 care. How about that mad face? How about popping that on some Joel Olstein stuff? Okay, because we're angry along with God. God is angry with that. He said, I am angry with the wicked every day. And that means today, doesn't it? Exodus 32, 10 and 11. Now then let me alone. God says, quit, de- quit messing with me. Quit playing with me. Quit throwing my name out there all willy-nilly that my anger may burn against them that I may destroy them. Get out of my way. I'm about to kill a bunch of folk, God says. This has been his MO all the way through and we're about there again at levels we have never known. His destruction and anger is going to be so raging. It's going to be mind-blowing and people's hearts and minds are going to be failing them just looking at the things that are coming up on the earth. That's Nibiru and the Nephilim and the fallen ones. That's before they get here. They're going to have heart attacks before they make it here. God's anger is raging and he's going to carry out his rage for seven years till he kills them all. God's intention is to kill every wicked person person and he's coming after you in the seven year tribulation that's about to begin and you better get saved before he makes it your way you're gonna die most of you are gonna die he will kill you he will knock you down he will kill you dead but it's better to go to heaven when he kills you dead than go to hell when he kills you dead i encourage you to turn your heart to the lord now and be saved from all of his wrath right now there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in christ jesus and those who are outside of christ jesus it's only condemnation not condemnation that jesus put on you but condemnation he came to save you from because you were already condemned that's john 3 16 17 and 18 god sent not a son into this world to condemn it he came because it was condemned and he wanted to deliver you from it but you laughed at him you you loved football more than him you loved baseball you loved embroidery you loved your cross stitch you loved everything else better than him hey guys whatever you love more than him is your idol and god hates idol worshipers get out of my way let me alone my anger burn against them that i may destroy them and i will make of you a great nation moses moses stood up and said no how about not yet god said okay Numbers 11, 1 and 2. Now the people became like those who complain of adversity. Things are bad. And they just want to whine and complain and say to praise the Lord. And I will bless the Lord at all times. The church has become a complaining, whining thing, just like the children of Israel were. And God became so livid and angry with their complaints. In the hearing of the Lord, God hears it all. And the Lord heard it and his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burned among them and he killed a bunch of the outskirts of the camp. The people therefore cried out to Moses saying, please free us from God's wrath. And then the fire died out. The fire will die out after seven years. Not before then, guys. I'm encouraging you to get on the ark now. You believe the Lord. You humble yourself and believe now. And make the count with us, will you? We're about to start our count of the wood tomorrow. Isn't that exciting? Day one, day two, day all the way to day six. Day three is a very important day, we believe. Verse, uh, this is Job 4, 9. By the breath of God, they'll perish. And by the blast of his anger, they will come to an end. Have you heard Joel preach that lately? Have you heard TBN preach that lately? Have you heard God TV? This is God we're talking about. So God TV must be talking about a different God. Huh. Isaiah 13, 5. They are coming. This is concerning his Nephilim, his giants. Okay? And and this is Isaiah 13 concerning the tribulation when God sends forth all his Nephilim and giants back, the demon seed, to destroy mankind. That's what this verse is saying. They are coming from a far country, from the farthest horizons. The Lord and his instruments of his indignation and their purpose is to destroy the whole land. God is coming in judgment. You better take the preacher seriously. You better take God seriously. You better take his word seriously because he's coming for you. He's coming and gunning right for you, man, unless you're saved. 
If you're saved, there's now therefore no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Aren't you thankful for those promises? But if you are not saved, his rage is infuriating more and more and more every day. It's piling up against you like water behind a dam. And the dam, as soon as the rapture happens, is going to open and destruction for all for the next seven years. And this is God doing that, the God of love, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And guys, if you're going to dis- describe our God properly, he's also the God of wrath, the God of anger, the God of rage, the God of justice. You know what he's going to have justice over? All these wicked people on our planet who are mistreating the righteous, who are mistreating the little ones, who are killing them in their mama's womb, who won't let them pray in schools, who are teaching them to go to drag shows at the library. He's coming after those people who have harmed his innocent ones. That's our God. He's always done that and he always will and he's about to do it in the greatest rage ever known in our 6,000 year existence. The Chaldeans, this is Jeremiah 32, 29. That's the Babylonians who are in fighting against the city will enter and set this place on fire and burn it to the ground with the houses where people have offered their incense to Baal. You look up and you see the chemtrails, barium and aluminum are bay a or B A A L. Baal. Baal is the god of weather, the god of thunder, the god of existence and fun, partying. And that's who our church worships. Our church doesn't even know Baal's above them, but they hail Baal at the football game. They hail Baal at the basketball game. They just root for every other idol that comes in the place of God. You think of the biggest Dallas Cowboys fan you know in this area. This, we're in the Dallas Cowboys. Do they get that jacked up for Jesus? Those guys suck. They lose year after year after year and people get jacked about him. Our God is good. He's wonderful. He's awesome. And who gets jacked up over him? He knows. He's coming, man. He's going to take all the people who burned and offered incense to bail on their roofs and poured out drink offerings to other gods to provoke him to anger. Drink offerings. People will go to Wings to Go, order them a pitcher of beer, and then make drink offerings to their gods on the TV screens. All the sports bars, all the sports clubs, everything. The Olympics. It could, it could be synchronized swimming, and people will be offering their drinks unto other gods because they love that more than they love Jesus. Jesus says, uh, I need to give you a clue here. You'll love me when you love my word. And when you love his word, you'll seek to know his word, and you'll seek to do it. What you found out in those pages. Lamentations 2.2. 2. The Lord has swallowed up. He has not spared all the habitations of Jacob. This is his people. This is Israel he did it to. His chosen ones. He's going to do it to the church who claim to be his chosen ones who are not. We're going to be raptured and they're going to be stuck here. They're going to be stuck here with John MacArthur and the rest of them preaching Calvinism. And they're going to say, this is the only way you can get to heaven through Calvinism. Hey, guys, it's best if you accept the plan of salvation from Christ Jesus, not John Calvin. Okay? I encourage you in that. They, they both are JC, but one's false and will send you to hell, and the other is true and will send you to heaven. Jesus Christ and him alone. And his wrath, the strongholds of the daughter of Judah, he has brought them down to the ground. He has profaned the kingdoms and its princes. And that's what he's about to do, right? Because God works in a pattern. He works like this. He did it then. You saw what caused him to do it then. We've been doing the same thing for years and years and years now. The grace has run out. The glory has run out for America. We have worshipped a statue in New York Harbor who's a dude in cross-dressing, in drag, Because the Canaanites have always worshipped like that and their priests have always been that. That's what Baal is all about. Moloch is all about is cross-dressing. The Canaanite priests, would, the men, would dress up like women because they thought and they teach in Kabbalah that we are all one. We are both. When you come to the end of your line of reincarnation, you're ultimate when you are both male and female in balance. That's what they have always taught. That's what they teach. That's what the whole world's teaching. That's why we got all these men becoming women and women becoming men. And we got men loving on men and women loving on women because we're back to the Canaanite ways that God hates. And he told the children of Israel, when you come into the land of Canaan, clean it out, get rid of all that stuff. And they said, well, I I did my part. I'm going to sit right here. And they enjoyed their lands and their houses and their cows and everything and watch it grow. Meanwhile, the Canaanites still existed. 
And they begin to expand throughout the world. Finally, Joshua runs them all out. David didn't, he, Joshua didn't run them all out. David did. But they still existed. They didn't kill them all. And they went to other parts of the world waiting to come back in God's judgment, his indignation, his wrath. Numbers 32, 13. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel and he made them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Why? Because they simply didn't believe. They didn't go do some atrocities, though they did atrocities, but that wasn't why God was enraged. He was enraged because of their unbelief. Jesus could do no mighty works there in his hometown of Nazareth because of their unbelief. God hates unbelief. He's the only truth. So when you don't believe him and his word, you're believing lies. You're believing the devil. Devil is the father of lies. He was a liar from the beginning. That thief was a liar from the beginning, and that liar was a thief from the beginning. And anybody who doesn't know the truth of God and love the truth of God and live in the truth of God, you're living in lies and God's anger will be enraged with you just like it always has been because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Joel Olstein will preach that. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Love, 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 love. Joel, go back and read your Bible. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that includes his wrath too. That's everything about God. God is balanced. He is love and joyful towards his children, his baby. He shows his love to the enemies, to Satanists, to devil worshipers, to the Canaanites, to wicked men at Calvary. The truth is you need to get to Calvary and experience the love of God by your belief. God destroyed a whole generation of Israelites who left Egypt because of their unbelief. And his anger was raged against them and he he made them wonder for 40 years until they all died off except two of them. Who were those two? The two guys with belief. Joshua and Caleb, the guys who believed. I'm encouraging you to believe. I'm encouraging you to jump off of everything. The evening news, if you believe anything the evening news says, you are right where Satan wants you. Because everything around us is an absolute lie. Not a partial lie, not, not a little bit. Of, it's an absolute lie. And when you know your scriptures, you know that it opposes everything God has said. And they're set up. 2 Kings 13, 3, so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel and he gave them continually into the hand of Hazael, uh, king of Aram, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazael. Isaiah 51, 20, your sons have fainted. They lie helplessly at the head of every street like an antelope in a net, full of the wrath of the Lord. The rebuke of your God has done this. These are Israelites. These are people who went to church every week. God is sick of people who go to church every week who won't come to his throne anytime. We have now been offered the wonderful opportunity to come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find his grace to help us in our time of need. And the only time we go to him is when we just really have a great need. Other than that, I don't need you, God. God has really tried to teach us that I need him, that oxygen you're breathing. Where'd that come from? That's my need for God. That grass that grows in your yard that gives you oxygen, that's what supplies the oxygen is the grass and the trees. Do you thank him for those things? Do do you, when you step outside your house, are you in church? You are the church. You are the temple of God. Are you always walking with Jesus in his mercy and grace? Or are you facing his wrath because you're a fakey? You call yourself Christian, but you're not because you have added more to Jesus Christ than God added If you add anything or take anything away from God's plan, you oppose God. And he clarified that in the book of Revelation concerning that very book. Don't you dare change this book. And everybody's changed it. Jesus Christ has now told us he's coming pre-trib. And I mean, he's verified it over and over in the English language so we could read it. I am coming pre-trib at the Pentecost time, the spring rapture. And people still defy that. They deny it. They make up different stories. In indignation, this is Habakkuk. 3.12, in indignation, you march through the earth, Lord. In anger, you trample all the nations. This is where God's heart is now. He's about to step out and do this. But before he does this, he's gonna call all his children home. He's gonna call his bride home. He's gonna call his body home. Doesn't that sound like a wonderful plan of salvation all the way through? And now he's gonna bring indignation and destruction. Ezekiel 7, 8, now I will shortly pour out my wrath on you and spend my anger against you, judge you according to your ways and bring you all according to your abominations. God sees everything. And the God who sees in secret will reward you openly. And that's both to the righteous and the wicked. Matthew 21, 12 and 13, and Jesus entered the temple and he drove all those people out who were buying and selling. 
You know, there's a whole bunch of people buying and selling in church today. Give your offerings, give your offerings, give this, buy my new book, buy this, buy that, buy this. Jesus gave everything away. He has always hated the exchange of his grace and his mercy, his gifts for money. Freely you have received, freely give. This is the heart of God and the American church and the American way and these people living off their people. All these people traveling and selling their book on their tours all around from stop to stop to stop, propagating lies. Amir said this week, yesterday, two days ago, uh, those red heifers mean nothing. You, you can't count that as far as God's end time count and signs that he's coming soon. You retard, you idiot, you fool. That's all it is, is a sign from the Lord that his salvation is near. His rapture is near. We've warned against this guy over and over. His salvation plan is right. I don't know if he believes it or not, but he preaches it right. And he preaches the whole eschatology and everything else wrong, opposing plain text scripture. And I'm encouraging you people, you follow God. You know him. Don't you follow man. Don't you follow the heart of man and the mind of man and the mouth words of man. You follow God. You follow his holy word and you know what he's saying and you believe it. You grip it tightly. You're going to give an account. Does Jesus count every hair of your head? Why did he give us that verse? Because he said, I'm counting every second of your life. I'm counting every word. I'm counting every thought. I'm counting. And that's what the judgment seat's all about. He's not going to ridicule you and bring you down and, and be all forceful over you for the stuff you didn't do. He's going to offer you the stuff you did do. I hope it's a lot for him, for his glory. That's what he's going to do. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that there's going to be a whole lot of people there whose lives go through the fire, and it's not going to come out gold, silver, and precious stone. They'll come out smelling like smoke. They'll be saved, yet so as by fire. They didn't do nothing for God. And why they're there is because God did everything for them. Okay? And that is salvation in the justification form. Salvation in the sanctification form is where you say, now I'm going to take every bit of my life and I'm going to offer it to you, Lord Jesus Christ, to your glory. That's what I want to do because I want to have crowns to throw at your feet. This is all for you is why I'm doing this, Lord. And that's what he's coming to. And everybody else... He's coming at you in his indignation and wrath. He is sick of you. Habakkuk 3.12, we read it, but I'm going to read it again. In indignation, Jesus, you march through the earth in anger. You're going to trample all the nations. Isaiah 13.9, behold, the day of the Lord's coming, cruel and with fury and burning anger. To, why? To make the entire land desolation, all you people buying your houses and selling and getting gain. As it was in the days of Noah, people were marrying. That means they're planning for a long time. It's not a problem to marry right now, okay? But when you marry right now thinking you've got years ahead and kids and grandkids, that's wrong. Because you oppose God and you oppose his plan and you oppose all the signs that we have seen in the last 15 years, 12 years, 10 years, 7 years. We are now at the end of God's Shemitah warning. He gave us the blood moons. He gave us so many things, those cows with the number sevens on their head. He gave us those born on the feast of, I can't remember if it was tabernacles. I think it was the feast of tabernacles. That one cow was born with a seven on his head, the feast of tabernacles. God's given us warning after warning after warning. He's given us many warnings since then, the last seven years, that his approach is near. And his approach is going to be wonderful for those of us who are saved, and it's going to be terrible for those who are not. I encourage you, Jesus has invited you to be part of the blessed, part of the saved, part of his body, part of his bride, part of the eternal blessings and not eternal hell. He's invited you. Will you graciously receive the invitation of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? No, no. That's what most of the world's saying. I encourage you not to be most of the world. Isaiah 13, 9, Behold, the day of the Lord's coming, cruel and with fury and burning anger, to make the land a desolation, he will exterminate every sinner from it. Does that sound like a promise that he's going to keep? The word of God is true. Daniel 8, 19, and he said, Behold, I'm going to let you know what will occur at the final period of the indignation, for it pertains to the appointed times of the end. Aren't you thankful that God let you know everything that's coming? both heavenly, the rapture, both what's going to happen on earth to those who are left behind. God still offers salvation to those left behind, but the dispensation will change. No longer will you simply get to believe in the Holy Spirit enters you. The Holy Spirit's not going to enter you. You're going to have to believe and continue on in that belief until the day you die, until the indignation strikes you down or until you survive it. And blessed is he who makes it to the 1,335th day. Either way, you're going to walk with Jesus continually in that. There will be no mercy. There won't be no people just, you know, he smells like smoke, but he did nothing for God. You're going straight to hell if you do nothing for God in the tribulation. 
Amen? It's still saved by grace. God saves you by his grace because you don't deserve to be saved in the tribulation. I don't deserve to be saved during the grace period. I don't deserve this during the church age. I don't deserve it. It's all grace. It's a gift that we don't deserve. And that's what salvation by grace is all about. Matthew 3, 7. But when ye saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of snakes, who in the world has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? It looks like nobody did because they didn't feel there was a wrath coming. They just went on with their wicked unrighteousness at church and acting all pious when they were absolute hypocrites, when they were opposing what God said. They hated what God said because Jesus standing in front of them was God telling them what he said and they didn't like anything that he said. And same way with the church today. I'm encouraging you, church, to fall in love with Jesus, to fall in love with his word, to shut your TV off, to shut everything out. Guys, we may only have just several days left. The Lord may rapture us by Friday. Are you counting? Do you know where we are in the count? The wood count starts tomorrow. 2 Kings 17, 18. So the Lord was very angry with Israel and he removed them from his sight. We're going to do the same thing right now. Be saved today. None was left except for one, the tribe of Judah. They were the only one who was righteous in his sight. And he took away the entire northern kingdom. Psalm 78, 59, when God heard, he was filled with wrath and greatly abhorred Israel. When you oppose God, God abhors you. He can't stand you. You know what he said about the Bible code? If you scoff the Bible code, you are an abhorrence to God. You're scoffing his word. You better come, come to believe that. You better come to understand how God worked, how he's come just before he judges with a document, many documents that clarify everything with specifics, details, names, dates, everything. You better receive it. You better hug it. You better embrace it. God says, if you don't, you're an abhorrence to him, just like Israel was. And what happened to Israel? His wrath came against them. Psalm 98, 38. But you have cast off and rejected. You have been full of the wrath against your anointed. God is soon going to cast off everybody, all the creations that he made after he raptures us. All the saved will be raptured. Pre-trib rapture will go to heaven. If you don't believe in the pre-trib rapture, you don't understand the mind and the heart of God. You don't know his love for you. You don't know his love for sinners. He wants to save us. He's going to salvage us. He's going to reward us. All things will be top-notch, full-blown in heaven while everybody's having the lowest of hells here. And I pray that you get in the boat now. You follow him. You get rid of your pride. You get rid of your unforgiveness for others. You get rid of your sinfulness. And you believe that Jesus Christ became all your sin. Just place all of that on him. Allow all of the sin that you've committed in your life, believe it, that it has been placed on him and it has already been judged by God the Father. Will you believe that? Will you believe that it's all gone forever and you don't have to do anything to keep or maintain your salvation? Will you believe that he took your sin to the lowest hell and left it there as far as the east is from the west? And he rose from the dead for you so you could live in resurrection and not live in death. We were living in death until Jesus came along and we learned of his resurrection and now I can live a resurrected life in him. Will you please do that? And God cast off and he rejects. One last one. Lamentations 2, 6 and 7. And he has violently treated his tabernacle like a garden booth. He has destroyed his appointed meaning. That's why there's no temple there in Jerusalem right now. And that's why they're coming back with this temple. This is a satanic temple. This is a temple that doesn't belong because you and I are the temple of God. There should be no other temple, brick and mortar, no more, no longer, no sacrifices of animals made at this point. They will be later when Jesus returns. There will be animal sacrifices based on Ezekiel because God uses a show and tell to point everybody back to what he did for you because people are forgetful. People need reminders. But right now, it's an abhorrence. It is an abomination to God to sacrifice animals in behalf of salvation, on behalf of salvation. And he has violently treated his tabernacle like a garden booth. He has destroyed his appointed meeting place. The Lord has caused to be forgotten the appointed feast and the Sabbath in Zion. He has despised king and priest. In the indignation of his anger, the Lord has rejected his altar, the place of sacrifice, what people have chosen. Because there's a new altar at Calvary where Jesus was, became the sacrifice and offered himself. You know, that was the same altar where Abraham and Isaac were, Mount Moriah. It's an altar, and that's the altar we go to today in faith, where Jesus Christ offered himself on the altar all by himself. He was pinned down, 
tied down. When you read about the animals, they're all tied down to the altar so they won't move. Then they're, they're slit. Their blood is let. Jesus let his blood. He bled his blood everywhere all day from the time they were beating him from the garden till the time they were beating him. He dro- was dropping blood, dropping blood, dropping blood all along the way. And it's his sacrifice that counts. He has despised the king and the priest and the indignation of his anger. The Lord has rejected his altar. He has abandoned his sanctuary. He has delivered into the hand of the enemy, the walls and the palaces. They have made a noise in the house of the Lord. Praise Jesus. Oh, praise the Lord. There's a lot of people making a bunch of noise today. And they offer their sacrifices unto other gods. They love something. Thou shalt have no other God before me. And they've turned, Satan has subtly turned it around that people don't know they're worshiping other gods. And they are worshiping idols and they are sacrificing unto these idols and they have been beguiled. They are deceived. Those of you that love football and basketball and baseball and the list goes on, you love your children more than me, you're not worthy of me. Love your parents, you're not worthy We are to hate them. Our love for Jesus must be so awesome that it looks like my love for my family is hatred. Because when Jesus says something and my family that I love dearly says something and they oppose each other, I go, Jesus. And the family thinks I hate them. I don't hate them. I, I love them dearly, but I love Jesus more. Everybody catching it? That is the call. You do what Jesus said. We're about to see him. I'm not going to be facing these false accusers who, who judge unrighteously. I'm facing a wonderful Jesus of truth who judges righteously. And I want to listen to him and hear his voice and do what he says. I'm about to see him face to face. I want to please him. I want to have a bunch of stuff to offer him when I get there. Amen. That's your life. Uh, let's look over there at the Ezra passage. Ezra chapter 2, beginning in verse 68. The seven red heifers were brought. They're pure red heifers. They have no other color of hair in them. They were brought in from Texas. A ranch in Texas was raising them. They flew them in on a 747, landed. I would have thought it would have been a C-17, but the article said 747. So they flew them in, they landed, and they made sure they were healthy and looking good, and then they introduced them to the public. Now we know that they're there. They're getting ready to build the temple, that means. They've got to burn the red heifer turn its entire body into ashes. Then they'll take ashes and water and mingle them together and they'll consecrate all the holy places and holy things with them to separate them unto God. That's a Levitical command, okay? But what they're missing is they don't need to be doing this because Jesus Christ is the temple. There's no need of temple in heaven because Jesus Christ is that temple, okay? It's a faith walk. It's a faith thing. And so that, that happened this week. That, that is another clue that the rapture is near. Guys, the rapture is near. The rapture nears, and God is going to rapture us, pre trib rapture, during Pentecost, the spring Pentecost, and that ends this month in about seven, eight days. Okay? So if he's going to rapture us this year, it's going to be within the next seven, eight days. If not, what's going to happen? We're going to count next year. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. Uh, chapter 2, verse 68. And some of the chief of the fathers, okay, they had been in Babylon for 70 years and now they're going back to rebuild the temple at the command of the Lord because Jesus Christ hadn't come and become the final sacrifice saying it is finished yet. So they're getting out of Babylon. They're heading back to Jerusalem, a 900 mile trip. Remember, Ur of the Chaldees, 900 mile trip. Uh, Abraham, the Syrian, 900 mile trip. Same trip. And now they've had time to rethink and reset and get their hearts right with the Lord. And they're coming back to build a temple in this passage. This is Ezra 2, 68. And some of the chief of the fathers, when they came to the house of the Lord, which was at Jerusalem, they offered freely for the house of God to set it up and get it erected properly in its place. And they gave their ability to the treasure of the work, three score and 1,000 drams of gold, 5,000 pounds of silver, and 100 priest garments. They were getting ready for a temple when there was no temple. They had faith. They brought their gold, their silver, and they made priestly garments for 100, 100 priests. Okay? Verse 70. So the priests and the Levites and some of the people and the singers and the porters and the Nethanims, that's servants in the temple, dwelt in their cities and all Israel in their cities. What they're getting ready to do, guys, and they have been for the last several years, is having a sacrifice without a building. You can go online and watch them doing their sacrifice services. They've been doing it. 
but now they need to make it official with these red heifers, and those red heifers have to be two years old in one day or whatever it is, and then they consecrate the the entire temple place so they can build the temple. They know they can't build the temple yet, but they don't need a temple based on Ezra to offer sacrifice. I want you to understand that. You're watching a biblical concept taken out of context. Okay, they're doing what they're supposed to do, but they're not supposed to be doing it now. This is a former event, not a present one. But they're doing it. That's a sign that God's going to be enraged, right? Remember all those verses we just read? When you oppose him and his way and his will and his word and his savior and himself, and you kill him in the streets of Jerusalem, instead of receiving him in resurrection, you leave him dead instead of allowing him to be raised in your life, he's going to get angry and God's about to flip. These red heifers that they have been working over and over are making God angry because they do not belong. But they are part of his plan because we see Barack Obama going into this very temple that they're about to build and he desecrates it with an image of himself and he declares himself to be God above all gods. And anybody else who doesn't believe that, you're going to get killed. And this temple is going to be that. It's going to be a house of death, a house of lies, a house of ill repute. And knowing these guys, they'll have prostitution there. They'll raise up prostitution because they defy God in every way. And that's what the foreign temples all did. When you study Molech and Baal, they had prostitution out there because they, they believed that if you would have sex with one of the temple prostitutes, you'd have a connection with the Lord because she was so connected to God, the gods. And that's what they believe. And that's what they're going to teach in defiance of God. Everything they're going to do with this temple will defy God. Okay. And he's going to do what happens to God when he's defied. He gets angry. He gets wrathful. His indignation rises. He becomes furious and he begins to destroy all the land. Chapter three, Ezra, verse one. And when the seventh month was come and the children of Israel were in the cities and the people gathered themselves together as one man into Jerusalem. Do you guys know that this is the call for us right now? We are to call ourselves one man. We are to be in unity in the things that we know are truth in the Lord Jesus Christ and not be rebellious. We are to know the word of the Lord. We are to know the Lord himself and we are to be unified in that together. That's what God wants in the church is not that. They're building their own kingdoms. Instead of building the kingdom of heaven, we got, uh, you know, John Hagee Ministries and he's building his kingdom over there. And then we got this other guy, Morris, over here building his. And we got that other guy over there building his. We're all one together. We're unified in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be. Verse two, then stood up Jeshua, the son of Jazadak, and the brethren, the priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shatiel, and the brethren, and they builded the altar of God. That's what you're about to witness. And they're basing everything they're doing right now in Israel on this passage. Build the altar without a temple. The temple was built later. And his brethren built the altar of God in Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it was written in the law of Moses. At one time, it was good to do it. Solomon built a temple, it was destroyed, and then Ezra comes along and builds another temple, and God blesses it because Jesus Christ hadn't come on the scene yet. Jesus Christ in AD 70 made sure that temple was burned to the ground and destroyed, and not one stone left standing. Amen? Because that's how God does it. When he says, see that stone, right? See this place right here? Peter just said, man, Lord, look at these stones. One of the disciples, look at these stones. This is an awesome, amazing building. They had been up in Galilee all their lives and they had never seen the temple. And now they're there. It's blowing their minds. And Jesus looks over at them and says, it's all going to be gone here shortly. Not one of these stones will be left on top of another. And in AD 70, that prophecy, because everything Jesus did was what? Prophecy? Everything he said? He was prophecy, prophecy, prophecy. And he said, it's going to be destroyed. And when we read Ezekiel 40 and following, we see that Jesus is going to build his own temple for the earthlings to come to. Amen? Is he the carpenter? Is he the tectone? Is he the one who works with his hands and he does a great job at it? He's going to build his own temple. And these people, Barack Obama and the one world folks, are trying to usurp Jesus and get Satan to sit in that seat in the temple. And it's going to happen at mid-trib. And then Jesus comes back, kills them all, wipes them out, and says, get out of my temple. And he's going to build his own. What's God going to do when there is a false temple and the people have turned their hearts from him? He's going to destroy that temple and build another, okay? Verse three, and they set an altar upon the bases. What bases? The bases that were there previously. They got back to the old way, guys. You don't do something fresh and do something new and look how we're going to do it now. Purpose driven. No, no, no. You go back and you set on the old foundations of scripture and you plant your churches and you preach the word based on the old foundations of the altar. 
where it was, God's heart, what God meant, what he said. You go there and you stay there and you never leave there and head to the groves and worship God in the high places because these are prettier up here. The lights, the flash, the pizzazz, the smoke, the tight jeans on my preacher. Oh, that's so much better than, you know, the old way. God called us to the old way. And middle of verse three, and they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and the evening. They reinstituted the morning and evening sacrifices. Verse four, they kept also the Feast of Tabernacles. That's the seventh feast of the seven found in Leviticus 23. We love that number 23 around here. The Lord loves that number 23. He gave your chromosomes 23 from your mom and 23 from your daddy. You don't think God likes that? You don't think that means something? They kept the Feast of Tabernacles. That's the seventh of the seventh. It, that's coming up here in September, guys. It's the 15th day of the seventh month in God's Bible. And it lasts till the 22nd. It actually lasts till the 21st, but then there's an extra day, eight days. Okay, so they got back. They set up the altar and they kept the Feast of Tabernacles. They built little booths and they stayed in those little booths. And they offered daily burnt offerings by number. And we're told how to, in the book of Leviticus, on the, on the Feast of Tabernacles, what you have to offer as your sacrifice. And they did that. They did it continually. And they did it according to custom as the duty every day required. They obeyed God. They were perfect in his will, in his word. That's where God wants every one of us now. There is no physical temple. You are the temple of God. And it is your temple on the right foundation, the foundation that, which is laid, Jesus Christ. Because there's no other foundation than the one that's laid, Jesus Christ. Have you built your entire life, your temple, your body, your existence on him? Or is it something else? Verse 5. And afterwards, they offered a continual burnt offering, both of the new moons and the set feast and the... Uh, the feasts of the Lord that were consecrated and of everyone that willingly offered a free will offering according to the Lord. And they, they did the same thing they did for David. They, they brought in the offerings to, to build the temple, to build the instruments, everything. The people gave an offering to build the temple. And here they do, they do the same thing for the second offering, the second temple. Verse six, this is Ezra three, six. From the first day of the seventh month, when is that? Tishri 1, which is the Feast of Trumpets. So they had the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, they began to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord was what? Not yet laid. You are in the middle of that right now. They've just brought the heifers. They're getting ready to consecrate, but they haven't consecrated yet because the heifers have to reach the proper exact age. But it's about to happen. The altar is there. And this altar opposes God because Jesus outside of Calvary, outside of Jerusalem, is where we are to go in faith, to believe and to be saved and be consecrated. Verse 7, they gave money also to the masons and to the carpenters, and they gave them food and drink and oil unto them or in Zidon who came from Tyre to bring cedar trees from Lebanon and the Sea of Joppa according to the grant that they had of Cyrus. Cyrus wrote a decree and said, hey guys, you can build your temple and you can get all the materials you need. Let's look at that again. Verse five. And afterwards, they offered continual burnt offerings, both of the new moons and of the set feasts and of the Lord. They were consecrated of everyone who willingly offered a free will offering. What time of season is the, when we give the free will offering? The Feast of Pentecost. The Feast of Pentecost is all about the free will offering. And you guys remember what we're offering? The barley, the wheat, the summer fruit, the new wine, the fresh oil, and the wood. Right? Keep reading. Verse 7, And they gave money also to the masons and to the carpenters and meat. Meat is grain, that's barley and wheat. And they gave drink, that's new wine. And they gave fresh oil unto them of Zidon who came. And they gave wood, trees out of Lebanon. And they offered that unto the Lord. Guys, why do we believe that the rapture may be this year? We have strong evidence that it's going to be this year. Why do we believe it's going to be on September 23rd? Because of the passage you just read. You guys know that... On the Jewish calendar, this year is divisible by both seven and the number 49. That is the Shemitah year and the Jubilee year. This calendar date is that. God is honoring their calendar that they brought up out of Babylon. Because that's the one they've used since before Jesus was here, since Ezra came back. 
So God's honoring that calendar. 826 Shemitahs. You know what 826 is? No tears of repentance. They're building this temple. They're excited about desecrating God and his land and opposing him. But there's, and they're talking about re repentance, but there's no tears of repentance. That's 826 Shemitahs from creation. 118 Jubilees from creation. Jews begin to follow Jesus. That's where we are right now. There's no tears. There's a rapture. And then Jews begin to follow Jesus. Those numbers, 826 and 118 total to 26. That's the number for Jehovah. yod Hey vav is the great 26. This is the year of God. This is the year of God probably for the rapture, us seeing him face to face and them seeing his indignation face to face. So many signs. Ezra is the 15th book. And we read the third chapter. 153. And we just read all that right there in the 153 count. All of the offering you bring to the Lord and you count them for 153 days. God's giving us clue after clue after clue. Elul 27. Elul 27 is September 23rd. Elul 27, 26, 25. Elul 25 is the very first day of creation and every Jew knows it. Elul 25 is when God introduced himself as light into the existence of the physical. Let there be light. That was Elul 25. That's coming up in a couple days. Elul 26 was the second day of creation and Jesus divided the waters from above and from below and we've already experienced that in the flood. Remember the waters from above broke loose and the waters from beneath broke loose? In day three... God gave us dry land. You know what he gave us on day three? He gave us barley and wheat and fruit and fresh oil, fresh wine, new wine, and wood all on day three. That's the 23rd of September this year. Day three. That's a Friday. I don't know exactly when he may come on that date, but I can picture a bunch of people in America... The sun's going down and they're at football games. And there's little kids running around with their big brother's jersey on. They're idle. And they're running around and the kids are out there, the people are out there playing football and the coaches are there and the parents are there. And it's a, have you ever been to a football game and there's a bunch of kids under the age of 12? Anybody seen that? And then the rapture may cause all those lights to go out. <laughs> Electromagnetic pulse. And all the children go missing while they were worshiping their gods. On a Friday night, Friday Night Lights. Remember that show? We worship Friday Night Lights, Texas football, Arkansas football, North Carolina, Florida football. That's where all the stars come from. The Southeast, if you want a good football player, you get him from the Southeast. And that's going to be a great night for that. The night when we were supposed to be counting through. And we don't even get all the way through day six of the wood count before it all happens. God cuts the day short, maybe. But Jesus Christ is going to come get us during Elul. That's when the king is out in the field. That is just before trumpets. Trumpets is when we'll crown Jesus in heaven. And trumpets is when he brings his wrath on earth. We're right there. We know that about trumpets. Trumpets is the coronation day. And trumpets is the day of warning. The day of blessing. Don't you bum -ba -dum -ba -ba, announce the king with a horn. And bum -ba -dum -ba -ba -ba, the, bu the reveille, the bugle, charge. On the same day on earth, I encourage you guys that the Feast of Trumpets to be sitting in heaven when that happens, Amen. to be rejoicing in heaven when that happens. Don't be here. Don't be here because what's that going to be? Hmm. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Sunday football. Monday, when it's all said and done, Monday night football, we Tishri 1, the 26th. We believe we're that close. Do you believe you could be that close right now? Yeah. Do you believe based on everything that you saw today, the indignation of the Lord opposing him brings out his wrath and anger and fury? We see that all around us, don't we? With the non-believers. We see Ezra as a template for what the people are doing against God right now. They're using an old template when God has already brought us a new template. 
belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're opposing him and bringing the fury of God on him. They went to great lengths to find these calves. We've been watching them hunt for them for seven years. They came to Mississippi looking for them. They come to Missouri looking for them. They come to the United States, Babylon, to look for their cows. Hello? And they found them in Texas, you know, the Lone Star State, the proud state. We're so great. We're so awesome. Okay. Okay. Guys, everybody's praising DeSantos right now and laughing about him sending all those foreigners. This is a test. Don't you laugh at that. Don't you have any part in that conversation? This is a test. They dropped him off on Obama's front lawn. Ha, 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 ha. That ain't ha, 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 if you know who Obama is. This is a test. DeSantos is with them. He is a Jesuit. Look at the colleges he went to. Oh, America, he's, he, he opposes the Antichrist. He is the Antichrist spirit. They're on the same team. Designed opposition. Why don't you know God's game plan and quit following their lie? You know the truth. You bring glory to the Lord, excitement to him because you love him. You love him when you love his word. You love his word when you read it, when you know it, when you speak it, when you share it, when you believe it. Amen. So many things pointing to September 23rd this year. So many. Be looking up. Be ready to be raptured. Get your heart right. Get your house right. Why don't you just be raptured right with God? He's going to rapture a whole lot of people who ain't right with God. They're right in right standing because of salvation, because of the blood. And after that, they went straight south. But the Lord's going to rapture them still because of his promise, because of his word, because of his seal of the Holy Spirit. They'll get to heaven. They'll smell like smoke, but they'll be in heaven forever. How about you? Most of you are going to smell like smoke. When God judges you here on planet earth, burn your houses to the ground and send you to hell and you'll smell like smoke forever and a day and you will hate yourself forever and ever and ever because you laughed at the preachers because you scoffed the Bible. You scoffed the truth. I'm going to encourage you not to do that. I'm going to encourage you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved and so will your house if they'll believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you deny him, if you scoff him, his anger is enraged. He's infuriated right now and he's coming after you and he knows right where to show up. He's going to kill you. He's going to kill you quick. And I'm going to encourage you to be not like the Jews who haven't repented and shed tears of repentance, but I'm going to encourage you to be as the Jews who as soon as the rapture has happened and Romans taught us that the rapture is going to provoke them to jealousy and they're going to believe and they're going to believe quickly. I'm going to encourage you to be part of that if you won't believe now. But our first point is we believe now. Jesus Christ is about to rapture his bride and you could be part of that and receive all the blessings of that as though you had been saved for 50 years. Amen. He is no discerner, of, no respecter of persons. He's going to treat us all the same because we are one man. We are one body in Christ Jesus. The one who came into the fold 70 years ago and the one who will come in in seven minutes or seven minutes ago. We invite you to be part of that. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you next week. Thursday night.